Good morning, everyone. My name is John Berentine, and I am the Director of Public Policy at the International Dark Sky Association. And today I will be speaking to you about good neighbor lighting policy considerations. So how can we set up various public policies for regulating outdoor lighting that help preserve good relations between neighbors and keep everybody happy. That we can achieve that goal, we'll keep light out of the night sky, we'll keep it on the ground where it is needed, uh, and we'll avoid these conflicts between neighbors as much as possible. So what I'll speak to you about today is outlined right here. Um, first I'll talk about the concept of nuisance in the common law, which is an attempt to prevent the problem and solve it before it even starts. I'll define what light trespass is because that concept is really at the heart of nuisance as it applies to outdoor lighting. I'll tell you how to find appropriate lighting for your projects that take these ideas into consideration. And finally, I'll talk about how we make these good neighbor policies um, compulsory through the law and we make them durable so that they're observed and again, try to prevent this uh, conflict from arising and to keep people happy. So first, about the common law and the idea of nuisance. There's an idea in the common law, which is different than the statutory law, the, the, the code of laws that has been written over uh, many hundreds of years from a sort of a set of norms or traditions that have evolved over centuries. And the basic rule of that common law is that it's obligatory to do no harm to other people. And that's whether by intent or omission. So it can be either proactively uh, avoiding certain behaviors that cause problems for other people or taking care that we're not creating problems inadvertently by something that we're not doing. And in the context of land use in particular and how lighting is applied to land use policies, nuisance is something that causes some sort of interference in an unreasonable way with the use and enjoyment of somebody else's property. So as much as we believe in the rights to our own private property, as a society, we feel that we have some obligation to our neighbors to ensure that our activities are not unduly infringing on their rights to enjoy their property. This comes in two forms. One is a private form of nuisance, which is most common. That's the dispute between private parties where outdoor lighting is involved. But it's also possible to have a situation where there is a public nuisance, where uh, somebody's land use interferes with the entire community somehow. So a, a property owner, for example, who is shining their light into a roadway where it is, is not wanted or needed would be a form of a public nuisance. And the courts have long since decided that these disputes are uh, justiciable, meaning that the courts have jurisdiction to resolve these disputes and they have been able to bring awards of damages in private suits about nuisance or issue injunctions that uh, force property owners to make changes to their lighting to abate the nuisance. So as the little cartoon picture implies, this is a balancing act. There are multiple uh, different motivations and considerations that go into this. We have to account for all the, the parties or players in a situation uh, and to try to find the resolutions that do the best job for the greatest number of people. So the, the core idea as applies to lighting in this case is this notion of light trespass. And the cartoon picture here suggests what this is. It's light that's emitted on one property that falls somewhere else where it's probably not wanted. The best analogy that I can make that most people are familiar with is noise ordinances, which your prob community probably has one. It basically says that you know, you're not entitled to have a loud party at two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Um, you should keep your sound inside your house and you're free to do whatever you want with it if it's in your house, but your neighbors shouldn't hear it uh, beyond some certain times that are declared in the law. So this is the equivalent of uh, a, a noise complaint or a, a sound trespass idea, uh, but it's with light. So what we want to try to do is encourage people to keep their light on their own property and prevent these common law disputes from arising in the first place. When you're creating lighting plans for your projects, uh, the best way to find appropriate lighting for those projects that take into account this idea is to look at our fixture seal of approval program, which you can access uh, at that link in the lower left. Um, we screen and vet different lighting products from different manufacturers according to the series of listing requirements that's there on the left. These are all 
elements of what we think are good lighting design that will again help keep the light where it's needed and prevent it from going to places that it is not. So you know that if you see our service mark on a product package or a product data sheet that it meets these criteria and when it's thoughtfully applied in a lighting design it will contribute to preventing light trespass and therefore eliminating the potential for nuisance in this regard. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these particulars in a minute because some of the listing requirements here um, are uh, directly pertinent to what we think are the good elements of outdoor lighting policy. So we'll come back to this. How do we make these changes durable in public policy? This is something that's been evolving for decades almost since the introduction of electric light a little more than a century ago, and it continues to evolve. Basically, this is a little crash course in how policies are made. There are two overriding kinds of policy that uh, evolve and are developed in the public sphere. These are binding policies that we usually think of as laws that we have to obey. And then there are non-binding policies, which are, are suggestive of things that people are encouraged to do maybe by a legislative body, but don't carry the force of law behind them. And then in the little cloud down in the lower right, uh, this is where we group together all these other things that are, are not necessarily what we would call policies, much less public policies, but they are policies nonetheless, and they influence people's behaviors. And so I, I put in that cloud things like decisions and precedents of, of courts, uh, the traditions and norms in our society, and the common law. Uh, you know, basically what we, we want to do is incorporate all of this. And on the binding side, that's where lighting ordinances live. So you have these uh, different ways of approaching it. Those can be literal ordinances, which are the, the local statutory laws, uh, but there are also regulatory laws that are not, they don't work in this quite the same way. They might be building codes, for example. What kind of lighting are you allowed to put on the exteriors of buildings? Or if you're in certain jurisdictions overseas, like the United Kingdom, they have a system of planning permission. You have to, to have your plans reviewed by a, a review board of some kind before you're uh, issued a, a certificate, a kind of like a building permit in the United States to proceed with the project. Uh, so there are ways to get at these different kinds of policy that affect the way outdoor lighting is designed and implemented. That again, is going back to this idea that we're trying to prevent these disputes from neighbors arising so that the, the courts never have to settle them. Everybody understands what the rules are, uh, and if we adhere to them, uh, we can avoid uh, these problems arising in the first place. Some of the principles in the policy realm that we deal with a lot as regards lighting are summarized here on this slide. Uh, I'll just run through them really quickly. The jurisdiction that a policy uh, affects is important. That basically tells you who regulates what. Most lighting policy in the United States is made on the municipal level. It's uh, to a lesser extent, maybe at the county or state level, and very little, if any, at the federal level. This is really considered to be a local issue. And so we run into concerns like supremacy, whose law governs. Your state might have some kind of outdoor lighting law but probably it will not apply to private property owners because that is typically delegated down to the level of, of local city and village councils. Um, there's also this issue of home rule. Should the communities themselves have the legal right to make this policy or, as in the case in certain states, are they prohibited from making these rules unless the state specifically grants them that uh, ability or does the state reserve that capacity unto itself? It really depends on where you live. So we have to know something about the jurisdiction in order to write good policies. How are actions regulated? There are different ways of doing this. There are positive and negative ways. You can either say you're allowed to do A, B, and C, but not D. Or you might have a policy that says everything is allowed except A, B, and C. So understanding whether you are proactively allowing certain things or simply prohibiting anything except for a short list will determine how this plays out in your community. A lot of people wonder whether uh, this can really be settled in the courts. So if you have a lighting ordinance in your community and uh, your local city government is not so interested in enforcing the details, people ask me sometimes, well, why can't we bring suit against them to try to compel the community to enforce? 
And there's a principle in our, our legal system called sovereign immunity that says essentially you can't sue the government unless the government consents to being a party in the suit. So uh, there are cases where there are statutory laws on the books that prohibit certain kinds of lighting that are not really enforced very rigorously, but the individual or the property owner retains the right through the common law system to bring private suits over the issue of nuisance. But again, we're trying to avoid that in the first place. And, and there's just this idea of best practice as well. Whether or not something is codified into law, the experts will recognize that there are these collection of actions that are known to be those that produce the best result. And sometimes merely adhering to best practice is sort of good enough in that respect. So we should keep these ideas in mind. What makes for good outdoor lighting policies? It's these few principles over there in yellow on the right uh, from warranting of lighting. You know, is, is the lighting necessary? Is it proper to deploy it in certain circumstances? We can further set that up according to zoning, like zoning overlays in a land use code. Fully shielding lights is important to prevent light trespass. Over lighting protection, making sure that we're not using vastly more light than is necessary to get the job done. We should worry about the spectrum or the color of that light because some colors are perceived more harshly to the eye than others. We should encourage the use of adaptive controls. These are things like dimmers, and timing circuits that ensure that you know, the light is there when it's needed and it's not when it isn't. That can be as simple as putting something like a motion sensing switch on a light. And plan review. If you're uh, especially like a, a commercial or industrial application, where you would have a lighting plan for a, a building complex, that should be subject to review by the community uh, authority in order to make sure that the, the lighting rules are being followed properly. So if we do all of these things, this is the outcome that we hope for. This is the goal. This sort of community or neighbor friendly lighting that's suggested in the picture, where now the person on the left is keeping that light on his property. It doesn't cross the property line. It's in the right amount. It's only there when it needs to be. It's kept out of both the night sky and the neighbor's window and avoids a lot of these problems as we said in the first place. So if we're very mindful about how we do this, we go about it deliberately, we craft good policies, we make clear what neighbor's responsibilities are to one another in the law, we can achieve this sort of outcome, which has benefits all the way around um, you know, it, it's good for astronomy, it's good for the nighttime environment, it's good for wildlife, and most importantly, it's good for community relations. And for that reason, this is why I think we should pursue these kind of policy goals.